Chris, you've been launching this around the world. What's the reaction been? Well, I think the reaction has been uh, very positive, and I think uh, there are several reasons for it. Uh, the cookbook analogy is, uh, I think, very apt and very useful insofar as uh, we're including a lot of the ingredients, if one will, for this internationalization process. It's really an unprecedented attempt by a country of the economy the size of China's to begin slowly but surely exporting its currency. And the way in which it's doing this is sort of a step-by-step, piece-by-piece uh, mixture of different flavors, if one will, uh, that are starting to spice up uh, global <laughs> markets. And so if we continue on the cookbook analogy, there's many chefs involved in, in this ascent. I mean, who are the key participants and what do they need to do for this to be successful? Well, that's a really good observation. And maybe that's where the analogy sort of ends uh, insofar as too many uh, cooks aren't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, having multiple cooks, in fact, uh, is, is necessary, really, in order for this process to move uh, in, a, in, in a smart, uh, considered, uh, prudent, safe, and effective way. Uh, you know, above all, we have China, uh, both as a country, uh, as the printer of its currency, and then you have a series of governmental institutions like the People's Bank of China and SAFE, but there are other kinds of regulators and market participants that the report details that are going to be increasingly important as China opens up its borders uh, to exporting its currency. Uh, but beyond China, we also have a range of other important countries. Uh, obviously, we have the United States. Uh, the United States is important, even if it is not being actively involved to the extent to which it probably uh, will be, or at least should be, uh, rather soon, uh, because it prints what is currently the dominant uh, global currency. But immediately, uh, we have other uh, financial centers, other countries that are playing a very important <coughs> role. Uh, Hong Kong is perhaps the destination uh, or the first stop in many uh, regards for the uh, liberalization reforms. It's a kind of testing ground, if one will, for exporting the renminbi where you would have pilot programs uh, that open up the usage of the renminbi for trade, uh, for investment, and other purposes. And then you have other financial centers in the region, uh, perhaps uh, uh, most notably Singapore, but really in the ASEAN region as a whole, uh, China is making an attempt to make sure that its currency is, is increasingly uh, used. Finally, when you move out of the uh, uh, Asia-Pacific region, you have uh, other kinds of participants in emerging markets uh, who trade uh, with China and who are uh, often part of the supply chain of even Chinese companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have, uh, very importantly, uh, uh, London, uh, Luxembourg, uh, even uh, Berlin and Paris uh, uh, that are playing incre incredibly important roles in helping to uh, facilitate the use, trading, uh, hedging, and other kinds of uh, financial services related to the renminbi here in Europe. And you mentioned many centers, many actors, if you like. What's in it for them and what's in it for the financial markets? We talk a lot about the advantages for China, but what about the global economy, the global financial markets? Well, you know, I think after 2008, uh, China, in particular, took stock of its exposure to U.S. Treasuries and said, uh, perhaps we shouldn't have this same level of dependence on the U.S. dollar. And in some ways, the internationalization process is a response, but it's obviously also a response to its own need to uh, modernize its economy. Now, China wasn't the only country that thought about their exposure to the U.S. dollar. And it wasn't the only country that thought about uh, their exposure to uh, 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 the U.S. economy and the future of the U.S. economy. And uh, there was uh, increasingly a sense that, uh, on the one hand, uh, there was a need to begin to diversify. Uh, uh, central banks around the world began to think about how to diversify their own holdings. Uh, secondly, as China itself made the decision to begin to internationalize its currency, uh, other countries began to consider ways in which uh, that uh, capital account and current account liberalization would be of use for their companies uh, that trade with China um, and also uh, for their own domestic financial services uh, providers uh, so that they could help to intermediate this particular process. So uh, just to give one or two concrete examples as to 
uh, what's in it, uh, you know, certain kinds of companies that, for, for example, may uh, uh, sell uh, goods to China may think that it's very important uh, uh, to uh, be able to offer their goods uh, in the local currency. Uh, they may uh, feel that it'd be very useful to also keep their hands on the currency even while abroad because uh, the renminbi has tended to appreciate uh, considerably over time and so as a store of value and as an investment it's quite attractive. Uh, many different kinds of uh, financial services uh, uh, professionals as well as retail investors have sought to have some exposure to the Chinese economy, particularly given uh, what has been an unprecedented growth rate. And so these are the kinds of things that drive the demand side, if one will, uh, for the renminbi. And notice that they're not just uh, always a kind of counter reaction against the United States, uh, but it's really a, a question of uh, quite literally buying in to the China growth story, but through uh, uh, means like uh, uh, currency uh, investment, um, uh, capital market investment, and obviously uh, the use of that currency to uh, hedge their own exposures uh, to the foreign exchange markets. And one of the questions that came up this morning was around you know, matching the trade purchase of goods or commodities with the currency. Why does that help? Why is that so important? In such well, a you, 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 you know, one of the, I, I think the first and initial observation is that commodities uh, comprise an incredibly large market, right? Uh, when you look at the derivatives markets in the world that are largely based on commodities and the trading of commodities, uh, any kind of activity that's denominated, uh, commodities-based uh, activity that's denominated in the renminbi will almost by definition add to the liquidity supporting mm. the currency. But uh, beyond that, uh, commodities are largely traded and in the dollar, or at least dollar denominated. And it's that dollar denomination where, say, uh, a company seeking to sell oil to China, uh, if Russia wants to sell oil to China or Kenya or uh, Angola or South Africa, uh, that sale will likely be denominated in dollars, which is interesting. And it's really a sign of the dominance that the dollar has traditionally had. Um, obviously, however, to the extent to which bilateral trade between any country begins to increase uh, and the ties between the countries begin to increase, uh, there's a certain degree of uh, um, uh, interest that begins to naturally arise as to how do you denominate those transactions in uh, one or both of the local currencies. Uh, this is also increasingly important because uh, if you're using uh, the dollar, both parties to the transaction have to uh, engage in converting that currency to their home domestic currencies, which, which doubles, if one will, the foreign exchange uh, costs. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain degree of efficiency. Uh, there's a certain degree of uh, comfort and ease that naturally arises mm -hmm. when you denominate certain kinds of transactions in your home currency and commodities is a place that people understandably would begin to think about. But if that happens, it would be an enormously uh, big uh, boost, certainly, to the liquidity of the renminbi. So it's to some degree a natural evolution. It's a sign of the demand um, for it. But, but with that evolution and the growth, we see renminbi being the what, fifth biggest trading currency. Um, we've seen on our own platforms a over 300% increase in trading volumes. There comes certain responsibility as well. Um, how does China step forward and, and become part of the international regulatory regime? How's that going to work? That's, That's one a, of the key parts of the report. Yeah, and we think it's really important. Uh, you know, when you think about uh, the internationalization of a currency, it's typically a kind of a conversation that economists have, right? Where mm -hmm. you have certain kinds of uh, 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 metrics uh, that are used to evaluate just how popular the currency is becoming. But when you think about how do you continue the growth of the currency, uh, it is uh, a question that ultimately involves not only uh, economics, but also certainly as you're seeing on your platform, finance, mm -hmm. and it also involves uh, rulemaking. And why is that important? It's because the renminbi uh, is not going to continue appreciating as quickly as it has in the past. China's economy uh, is slowing and maturing. And to the extent to which the uh, currency itself doesn't hold any kind of innate uh, value, or excuse me, uh, appreciation uh, value, uh, as it did in the past. Uh, people are going to have to, as we see in the United States, uh, <coughs> open the hood or kick the tires mm. and to look at the investment hiding behind the currency. So if I want to buy shares in a Chinese <coughs> company, 
it, I'm going to buy those shares not just because they're denominated in renminbi, but because I think that that company is going to be successful. Now, in order to know whether or not, or to have the information in order to evaluate whether or not that company is going to be successful, I have to have um, good accounting statements. Mm -hmm. I have to have a good uh, firm understanding uh, of what that company does and uh, 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 what its management is like, what kinds of decisions the management wants to take in order for me to put my money to use. And so one of the things that the uh, report is trying to emphasize is when you're really thinking seriously about trust and credibility in a currency, you have to think about the market ecosystem supporting that currency and the regulatory ecosystem supporting that currency. Mm. Because if you don't have those uh, two very important features in place, the internationalization process is only going to go so far. And so we believe that this isn't just a question of uh, transatlantic countries uh, wagging their fingers at China. It's also very instructive, I think, uh, for the Chinese authorities themselves that when they're planning and thinking through just how they want to uh, increase the cross-border use of the currency, uh, these kinds of questions like regulation, mm. regulatory compliance with those uh, uh, sets of rules will be increasingly important. Yeah, so you talk about uh, better in transparency, um, clear rules, regulations inside China supporting the currency, uh, but also cooperation on a, on a global level. There's an interesting decision coming out, which I believe has been postponed to November, which is um, does the currency be included as part of the IF, IMF's special drawing rights? Is that going to change things? Is that a big milestone as people are making out? I think it's a big important uh, milestone, uh, uh, a big important symbolic uh, milestone. Why? Because uh, to the extent to which China can have its currency included in that SDR ba basket, it is a sign of good standing. Mm -hmm. It's one of only a handful of currencies in the world that ultimately will anchor, at least formally, uh, the global economy. And uh, to the extent to which you can have an institution like the IMF that gives its blessing, if one mm. will, of the currency, uh, that is going to help uh, encourage uh, 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 even more usage. Now, one of the, the comments that we've heard already in Asia, and I think it's a, it's, it's a comment worth repeating here, is um, you know, whether or not the IMF ultimately includes the currency in its basket, uh, both countries and market participants will use it, and I think that's right. I think SWIFT had indicated, as, as well as uh, Thomson Reuters in, in uh, a variety of different uh, uh, data and reports, that uh, up to 60 uh, governments now have renminbi in their own um, uh, uh, domestic reserves, you know, some component of renminbi-denominated instruments. And that's pretty amazing uh, and pretty significant given where they started just five years ago. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, I think, uh, as you've already seen with the capital account liberalization, market participants, savers, uh, uh, foreign savers, foreign investors want to get their hands on this stuff. And whether or not the IMF makes that decision, people are going to want it. However, if you do have the IMF that formally acknowledges the renminbi uh, 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 as sort of one of the, the, the important players, uh, it will accelerate mm. uh, that process, and, uh, and, and it will be a boost of legitimacy and a confidence builder in that currency. And I think for that reason alone, it, it's, it's pretty darn important. So confidence, legitimacy, um, more transparency as a result of the underlying reserves and those things. And, and as you go around the world, Hong Kong, Singapore, London today, uh, Brussels, then Washington, particularly Washington, what, what are the questions going to be? What's the, what's the tone of the room going to be there? Um, the U.S. is often noticeably absent from the list of cities that are participating. Right. Um, no, it's, 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 it, that is an enormous uh, question. And, you know, I, I think in, in the United States, uh, there's a large degree of concern. Um, uh, uh, now, formally, uh, you know, this concern really, you see this concern playing itself out along the three different vectors that the report kind of, uh, uh, emphasizes. The fact that the internationalization of the renminbi, even though you have all these great kinds of things, like a more balanced global economy, more diversification of the portfolios, uh, greater uh, efficiency ad advantages for foreign companies, it still creates uh, uh, challenges along the vectors of uh, monetary policy, regulatory policy, mm -hmm. and foreign policy. Uh, the monetary policy most economists sort of understand if, if the 
if the currency becomes a dominant currency, then China starts to write its own macroeconomic rules and the kinds of choices it makes uh, in terms of its economy are going to have uh, larger consequences for the rest of the world. The regulatory uh, uh, consequences are if China builds out its own uh, regulatory, excuse me, uh, capital markets and exports those capital markets overseas, it will begin to uh, take even greater interest in what happens in the Basel Committee and the mm -hmm. final st st uh, Financial Stability Board, G20, and other forums. And it's going to let it, over time, let its voice be known on, on key areas of financial and regulatory policy. And then from a foreign policy perspective, and this is obviously what you'll also get to in, the, in, in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, when you build out that, 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 that regulatory or financial infrastructure, you get to have certain kinds of advantages. Um, you can reward friends. Uh, with uh, key market participants in your backyard. You can uh, punish enemies, if one will, by excluding them from your uh, financial uh, uh, system, uh, either through sanctions or through other softer uh, devices. Uh, and so it creates certain kinds of national security questions. And what, one, one brief thing is, you know, uh, as much as you, again, move towards uh, the capital account liberalization, there are certain kinds of prudential questions, you know, the transparency questions that you mentioned. You know, how exactly do these infrastructure provide? How exactly uh, are the clearance uh, uh, systems going to work? Mm. How, what kind of liquidity backstop is the People's Bank of China providing for some of these uh, clearing banks that are operating abroad? What kinds of regulatory rules do you impose? Uh, what is, kind of market supervision do you have for companies doing IPOs uh, mm -hmm. uh, overseas? These are the kinds of things that I think American regulators tend to kind of think about. And, and aren't we, we, we've worked actually with the Atlantic Council on the challenge for a bank. I mean, the banks are now the world's policemen. Uh, foreign policy, sanctions, fight against terrorism, Absolutely. financial crime. Absolutely. Banks are on the front line, get it wrong at your peril. This is making life more difficult for them. They'll have euro, they'll have dollar, they'll have renminbi. Sanctions might be different, rules might be different. How do they decide? Is this creating an impossible situation for the banks? Well, you know, uh, it, it, it is going to present, um, on the one hand, a lot of challenges uh, where you're going to need uh, a lot of help in helping to navigate these, these uh, different, very detailed regulatory regimes mm -hmm. that have to be complied with. And in the absence of compliance with these regulatory regimes, you could find yourself with several billion dollars of, of, of fines. There's, there's just mm -hmm. no doubt about it. Um, I think, though, from a system, you know, when you step back even, even further, uh, and this was also uh, mentioned earlier today in one of our conversations, and, um, is that to the extent to which the banks or the multiple uh, financial systems that are evolving provides opportunities to effectively arbitrage sanctions rules. Mm. That is, to opt out mm -hmm. of one uh, uh, financial system and into another, not because of the efficiency of the financial system or the quality of financial services that are provided, but instead to sort of opt out of uh, certain sanctions. That puts an additional pressure or stress on banks. That is, uh, they will increasingly become subject to the criticism, perhaps, of being enablers mm. of sort of arbitra uh, arbitraging different kinds of foreign policy regimes, and and that's no good for the world uh, and for the global uh, regulatory regulatory system. Uh, uh, ultimately, you need to have faith in uh, banks and in financial institutions and in economic management as uh, largely being uh, on the rules uh, uh, about uh, both uh, efficiency and uh, prudential uh, safety. Uh, but when you inject a certain, you know, when you go past a, a certain threshold uh, and you have a fragmented uh, mm -hmm. uh, financial system, yeah, we're going to have to deal with uh, a variety of challenges. Um, and one may ultimately be uh, the, the public's very faith in, in our uh, global financial system. Yeah, and it might be that actually China is more represented on some of the international standards boards and, and the boards that are looking at sanctions in these other areas. Um, one final question, Chris. You know, um, we've talked about the advantages, we've talked about the benefits this might bring, uh, and some of the risks that are along the way. Um, if I could ask you the impossible, which is to take a crystal ball and wind forward five years, what, what's, what's this multipolar world going to look like? Well, you, you know, uh, oh, that, that's, that's a hard question. I think that when you look at the internationalization of the Ruby, uh, it's useful to keep in mind that it's still 
despite the sort of exponential increase that we've seen along a, a variety of dimensions, it's still uh, a process that has a long way to go. It has a long way to go because you still have uh, 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 limitations on uh, accessing uh, Chinese investments. There are limitations on the degree to which uh, Chinese uh, firms can sell their securities and other financial products abroad. But in five years, what you will see, I believe, is a greater consolidation within Asia, for sure, of the renminbi's dominant status. And uh, to the extent to which it begins to sort of draw other um, economies and other currencies into its gravitational pull to create its own uh, renminbi block, uh, what you'll start to see even within five years is really the crystallization of the foundation of that regionalization process. Now that does not mean that in five years, all of a sudden, uh, we will all, uh, I as an American tourist here in London will be using renminbi to purchase uh, tennis shoes or suits. Uh, but what it does mean is that uh, uh, more and more countries' uh, currency decisions are going to reflect uh, what kinds of choices are going to be made uh, in China. Um, it's already happening and you'll see an acceleration of that process. I think uh, you'll see the development of new kinds of innovative capital account liberalization schemes like the mutual fund uh, mutual recognition program between Hong Kong and China where uh, in Hong Kong you may see the establishment of a very very large asset management base. Um, you're going to see uh, uh, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, a realization um, uh, certainly in North America and perhaps even in, in, in Washington DC as to the need to uh, more fully uh, engage that issue uh, in uh, fora other than just the IMF but in other international uh, bodies. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how all that plays out. Uh, but I think that you know, we list a couple of principles, guiding principles, <laughs> non-discrimination, um, putting uh, 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 the prudential concerns above the mm. politics, mm. Uh, making sure that to the extent possible we have market participants who are facilitating this process, that the host states to this infrastructure play by the same rules and impose the same rules that they ask of their domestic uh, market participants. You know, that's really going to be the only way forward um, as uh, the Chinese uh, currency becomes more popular uh, and as the Chinese financial infrastructure uh, uh, becomes uh, more mature. Thank you, Chris. The report is very clear. You laid out the principles. You've defined the cookbook, if you like, of, of how this is going to work. Um, we've been getting ready for over five years and have um, successfully built a lot of capabilities to support that. I think many of our clients around the world are doing the same. I think the message is be ready and prepared for this change. It's not even it. starting, it's well underway. Uh, and there's a big roadmap of, of future changes coming into this multipolar, multi currency um, world. Thank you, Chris, Thank for you. your work. Thank you for the sponsors, Standard Chartered. City of London Corporation as well for a fantastic landmark. Piece and thank of you, work. Thompson Reuters. <laughs> thank you. Yes.